We're moving into the foreign policy and politics section um, of this conference. It's always very excited, exciting because, as you all know, Japan's um, external relations tend to be yeah, quite volatile, um, especially its, its close neighbours in the region. We have a wonderful keynote speaker here to help us understand developments in Japan's foreign policy and politics, particularly um, Kishida's prime ministership tenure um, nearing its end and what we can possibly expect from his successor. And to do that, I'm delighted to welcome Professor Ryo Sahashi, who is an associate professor of international relations at the Institute for, Advan uh, Institute for Advanced Studies on Asia at the University of Tokyo. He also holds a PhD from the Faculty of Law at University of Tokyo, and he has many um, other um, less formal positions that, that he holds. He's an, a wonderful expert on the international politics of East Asia, um, also US foreign policy toward East Asia, regional security architecture, and also Japanese security policy. So I'm sure you're all going to have some questions for him, which I will um, possibly invite after his keynote or, depending on timing, um, after our foreign policy panel convenes. So I'd um, like to welcome now Professor Sahashi to the floor. Thank you for coming to join us. Uh, thank you, Loren. And uh, it is very nice to see you all here. And uh, uh, my name is Ryo Sahashi, uh, coming from University of Tokyo. So uh, what I uh, want to speak today is about Kishida's foreign policy legacy, uh, which I recently uh, contributed to East Asia Forum, uh, which you definitely check every day, every morning. <laughs> <laughs> This is, a, you know, needless to say, this is the most influential uh, blog uh, in East Asia. And uh, I'm really, really happy to contribute uh, this uh, piece. And also, I have contributed uh, last 10 years, like a 12 piece, uh, to this format. So I'm really, really thankful for that to Peter and Asilo uh, for helping me to uh, share my idea, thoughts with you. And uh, I also recently published uh, another article from Pacific Affairs, which is a journal articles uh, journal uh, from uh, University of British Columbia, uh, Vancouver. Uh, so I uh, explain why uh, Kishida uh, made revolution, not evolution, revolution uh, of foreign policy. And uh, uh, for that, I made uh, uh, two dozen of interviews to uh, Kishida administration high-ranking people. So uh, what I will, to, I will do today is uh, first uh, to share my perspective on Kishida's foreign policy. And you know, this is very funny, but uh, I will praise, to some extent, outgoing prime minister. <laughs> he made a lot. He achieved a lot. But he is outgoing. But I think you know, we have to admit, you know, even though he was unpopular uh, in domestic policies, uh, but he was uh, really good. Uh, Foreign, uh, foreign policy guy uh, from our perspective. And then in, in the second half, in the second part, I don't think you know, we, need, we don't need you know, like a 15 minutes for that, but like a 10 minutes. I want to talk about the future of Japan's foreign policy uh, with some prediction of new prime minister. But you know, we have now uh, 12 candidates uh, to become prime ministers. Uh, I don't know uh, who will win. I have some prediction. I will share uh, my thoughts, uh, not on uh, such a horse racing, but uh, on his, uh, foreign, his or her uh, foreign policy. So first part, uh, let me talk about uh, Kishida's foreign policy. I think Kishida is actually prime foreign minister. Uh, not the prime minister, but the prime foreign minister. This is my point. You know, he was foreign minister for many years under Shinzo Abe administration. You don't remember well, or you remember well, uh, Shinzo Abe, uh, who uh, governed uh, Japan for more than seven years, in total more. Uh, and you know, under uh, Abe, Shinzo, Kishida served foreign policy, I mean, foreign minister for many years. And he made a lot of contribution to that, including a free and open in the Pacific. And uh, after uh, he lost uh, his 
uh, race uh, to become a president of LDP, he finally won the game, uh, and he served Japan's uh, prime minister for three years, less than three years. But uh, most of his achievement is uh, foreign policy. And, and uh, most importantly, uh, he was a prime minister uh, when Japan was uh, chair of G7. Uh, this is a Hiroshima summit, and he originally came from Hiroshima region as a politician, so he, uh, for him, it was most important uh, to make a big success. And the second important uh, aspect is, because he is from Hiroshima, uh, he has a strong uh, attempt uh, to promote the nuclear agenda, non-nuclear agenda. Uh, so this is uh, uh, the hot shot from his international group of eminent persons. You know, he never popular, you know. Uh, so this is, this is uh, approval rate, uh, sorry for Japanese, but you know, uh, at the beginning he had 50% somehow. Uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, 50%. Uh, that is uh, approval rate, I mean, to support uh, Kishida. And blue is no, no to Kishida. And that, you know, starts from, say, uh, October uh, 2012. Uh, it was 50, 50, 50, uh, but after having uh, Abe's funeral, uh, that going uh, very bad, 30%. And Hiroshima summit pushed him up a little bit, but you know, then again he experienced a big decrease. And now he only enjoys you know, around 20% of approval rate. You know, uh, he is not so bad even in domestic politics. Like, you know, uh, this is of course, you know, debatable, but you know, he decided uh, to uh, operate against the nuclear reactors. Or he also uh, pushed uh, strongly about the uh, daycare service and other, you know, uh, social welfare uh, things, you know, for young families to raise their kids more easily. But, you know, his domestic politics agenda uh, have not been ap appreciated so much uh, by Japanese people. And as you know very well, foreign policy uh, can never push uh, prime ministers uh, you know, up to the uh, popular prime ministers, right? Uh, foreign, foreign policy is not uh, so much attracting to general voters. So he suffers a lot from this, but you know, I don't want to uh, explain this so, so detail, with so, so much detail, but he made a lot of things on foreign policy, especially on security front. He firstly uh, published three important documents for uh, Japan's uh, national security, national security strategy and other uh, documents. But what he promised uh, to hold first, increase defense budget to 2% of national GDP. And second, uh, introduce uh, strike capability, uh, including Tomahawk missile here. Of course, you know, in Japan, we had a plan to make a domestic, you know, uh, uh, tomahawk type missile, uh, but he decided uh, to introduce tomahawk missile from the United States uh, because, you know, it is very urgent, he said. So, strike capability is very important because in Japan's uh, security policy after the war, uh, we are said, uh, we are sealed, and United States uh, spear. So, this is a kind of, you know, Burden sharing between two, you know, countries. U.S. is spear and Japan is sealed. Uh, but you know, finally, uh, we start to change the balance a little bit, and the Japan start to have some spear. I mean, offensive capability to some extent. But more importantly, uh, Japan decide to increase defense budget very radically. You know, we are still in the process, uh, not you know, not achieving two percent of GDP for national defense budget. But still, you know we finally experienced this big curve uh, in defense uh, budget. Before that, we had, actually, we didn't have official 1% uh, seeding for defense budget, uh, but uh, in practice, you know, we felt uh, kind of 1% seeding of, uh, uh, for defense budget, uh, but you know, finally, you know, that seeding totally broken and now, you know, uh, Minister of Defense or Coast Guard, you know, on every uh, government affiliation, I mean, authorities, 
uh, really rush to propose increase of their defense-related budget. And uh, during Kishida tenure, Japan was also very busy in enacting uh, economic security agenda. I think uh, uh, this economic panel mentioned about economic security policies, uh, but also from my perspective, it is very important. Uh, Kishida administration uh, promote economic security agenda so much, uh, starting from Economic Security Promotion Act, uh, enacted in 2022, and, you know, recently, uh, sorry, it is not ongoing, uh, it is now, you know, uh, in the process, but introduction of security clearance system. So, you know, and also Japan, Japanese government uh, enhance export control, investment screening, and others, you know, and also industry policy, as the first panel said, like semiconductor. So economic security uh, also became big agenda under Kishida. And the finally, you know, the big change is uh, uh, Kishida was so much successful in having many lateral uh, security uh, arrangement uh, with Australia, with India, with Philippines, and with South Korea. Kishida is actually a very lucky guy, right? Because, you know, he didn't need to spend his political resource to fix the relationship with South Korea so much, right? Because Yoon Suno, South Korean president, uh, he really wanted to fix the relationship. And Joe Biden, US president, also he helped, you know, a three country to fix the relationship. And Japan, South Korea, you know. So Joe Biden uh, hosted the trilateral uh, meeting in Camp David last summer. My point is, Kishida, was and is very lucky guy, right? The external environment helped him so much uh, to enhance the minilateral arrangement, including Australia, South Korea, India, and Philippines. I think uh, the, our partnership with Philippines start to be very important. Uh, this is just a hot shot from uh, our spring meeting uh, with Philippine counterparts and Australian counterparts and US counterparts, and which is now creating squat. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's just a jargon uh, in the military, uh, but the Quad, uh, you know, with India, uh, start not to be so much popular uh, uh, because you know uh, it is not based in the alliance system. But the Philippines uh, really uh, uh, not substitute, but the uh, Philippines is a really good uh, country to deepen the security, substantial partnership uh, in this format. So uh, recently uh, we had a. Uh, two plus two meeting uh, with the United States and uh, they uh, publish uh, uh, public release. And you know, in there, India is not there. India was not picked up. And this entry Kishida visited Washington and DRA made a good speech and in the Congre Congre Capitol Hill. And also uh, he and Joe Biden published a very good joint statement, leader statement. India was not there. Philippines is there, Australia is there. And South Korea is there. So, you know, but minilateralism are also very important. You know, this is because, you know, United States really want to make that kind of things, right? Uh, this is not today's topic, you know, but uh, I'm now writing a paper, uh, you know, about American strategic thinking. In the past, United States uh, had a, a, you know, kind of big vision of making a San Francisco system in this region, according, according to Kent Calder, uh, in the Pacific Review 2004. Under that, uh, you know, United States keep a dense network of bilateral alliance, but unlike NATO, we didn't have any big multilateral security structures here in Asia. And it was very asymmetrical, and a special uh, priority on Japan, and developed trade access to US markets. But this is my argument. I recently, you know, think um, United States really want to make a new system here in Indo-Pacific. And for that, in addition to bilateral uh, alliance system, uh, they really focus on minilateralism, minilateral security uh, platform. And, uh, you know, they admit the uh, evolving role of Japan, the United Kingdom, and uh, needless to say Australia and other uh, allies. But especially UK uh, start to be involved so much to this region. 
and they encourage so much Japan increase the defense budget and also defense capabilities and special attention to Taiwan and special attention to economic security. So I think, you know, Kishida was helped a lot by this American motivation and American allies motivation, but he made a big success uh, because he knows what he has to do, right? So this is uh, uh, just a quote from my own uh, essay uh, to East Asia Forum, which you definitely uh, let uh, before coming here, uh, but, uh, <laughs> You know, I'm a professor. So. <laughs> uh, but uh, for me, very important thing is Kishida has, didn't have strong ideology or didn't have strong idea on foreign policy except nuclear things. But Kishida has some sense of politics. And Kishida really want to keep his power. So he is really, you know, how can I say, want to survive, wanted to survive. So, because his group in LDP is actually a very minority. So for, to sustain his power, he always, you know, need to uh, keep coalition with uh, mainstream uh, party, party groups, including Shinzo Abe groups and uh, former uh, Vice Prime Minister Aso's group and Motegi group. So uh, my point is, these group people are more hawkish, right? So Kishida wanted to keep his power, so he decided to co make a coalition with hawkish group. So uh, by that, you know, uh, he sustained his power for three years. At the same time, you know, for hawkish group people, Kishida is really good or has been very good because his image is dovish. His group in LDP has a dovish image in Japanese politics. It's a coach guy, uh, just dissolved because of scandal. But you know, uh, like a former Prime Minister Aso, former Prime Minister Abe, they wanted to use that pacifist image of Kishida to promote their agenda to promote you know, Japan's security policy toward uh, more uh, hawkish or realist uh, ones, including defense budget increase, including enhancing Japan-US alliance networks. So you know, Kishida sensed you know, what he had to do or has to do, and you know, LDP politics supported him you know, a lot uh, because you know, uh, Kishida was so much good in promoting the agenda they really wanted to achieve. So it's a you know, kind of tandem, you know. A hawkish group and dovish group, I mean dovish leader Kishida, was, were in good tandem uh, to uh, promote the uh, big ban of Japan's security policy. I don't want to say it's a the emergence of militarism in Japan. You know, this is not such a big thing, right? This is just a, you know, just a 2% uh, of GDP for national defense. You know, uh, surrounding country, uh, the country surrounding Japan spend more. And, you know, Japan cannot, you know, uh, match against them, even with increased budget. But I want to say this is not evolution. This is revolution. You know, uh, if you are familiar with Japan studies, you know, in international relations, uh, we have uh, this debate always. This is evolution or revolution? And, uh, uh, you know, there are some people, uh, evo evolution uh, camp of people always say, oh, everything is evolution, right? This one, evolution, this one, evolution, right? But I think, you know, uh, Kishida made a big achievement, and which we have to call revolution, as, you know, I explained already to you. But why revolution, revolution uh, happened? Because Kishida wanted to survive uh, in politics. And shadow of Abe was also very, very, you know, strong uh, until 2022, uh, until his death, assassination. So uh, many things happened. 
I explained about defense budget issue and cap strike capability, but you know, we also change space strategy, cyber capability, and defense equipment export, and official uh, security assistance. You know, I cannot explain all, uh, but you know, uh, it's a big change. And why it happened? External factors might uh, be good independent variable, but I really want to suggest uh, domestic politics so important. And Kishida and other people uh, made a good you know, combination. So Kishida achieved a lot, but concern remains for Japan, right? Uh, as maybe easily shared with you, uh, you know, we are in a security dilemma uh, in Northeast Asia. Not only in security realm, but also in uh, economic realm, right? Um, we have a very strong concerns about gradual disintegration of interdependence in Asia and in the world, not only uh, to the uh, global value chain networks, but also we have a strong concerns about the weakened uh, international governance in trade regimes and others. And the second concern is, needless to say, declining U.S. internationalism. Uh, we are not so sure at this moment of which side will win in Washington, I mean, for White House. Uh, but, you know, uh, Trump or Harris both shares one thing, decreasing internationalism or decreasing uh, political base in United States politics uh, for internationalism. So uh, this is our concern. And also, we have the final big, but very big concerns on the uh, regional or global Eurasian uh, security architecture. That is an easy frontier of authoritarians. I really love this photo, uh, Kim Jong-un and Putin uh, made a, a really historic drive. Uh, I really want to pray for safe drive, but uh, um, you know, this, is a real big change in our politics, right? I mean, access between Pyongyang and Moscow uh, could be a game changer for us in Northeast Asia or Eurasian politics. I was in Seoul National University for a year uh, until this spring uh, because, you know, I'm learning Korean, but also uh, I want, uh, wanted to learn the South Korean perspectives on international uh, politics. But, you know, everybody, Almost everybody I talked in Seoul or in Busan uh, uh, made uh, uh, always, you know, reminded me the importance of, you know, this axis. And you know, uh, they, they recently published a part, new partnership uh, between uh, Russia and uh, DPRK. Some people uh, say, you know, uh, Putin still has some reservation. Uh, so, you know, this is not uh, meaning, you know, Moscow will intervene automatically uh, to the regional conflicts. Whatever, you know, that doesn't, that is fine. You know, all countries want to keep their autonomy. But more, impo more important thing is two countries, DPRK and, you know, Russia, uh, now having a big shared interest. And this will be sustained for uh, some moment. China uh, is still trying to keep some distance from this strong axis, but the China are also uh, you know, uh, still in a good partnership with uh, Moscow and DPRK. And other authoritarian countries like Iran and others also uh, you know, uh, collaborate uh, to each other. But our more concern we have is uh, their influence uh, is endorsing, including BRICS Plus. You know, BRICS is now endorsing, you know, expanding so much, and even two countries of ASEAN, at least, are attracted by BRICS Plus. This is our concern, right? You know, it is easy to say, oh, they are united frontier uh, from authoritarian camps, but uh, you know, they are other blocks. No. These people, these countries, uh, start to show big political influence uh, over uh, or beyond uh, the sphere of authoritarian states. 
So, you know, we have many concerns. You know, Kishida made a lot, but we have these kind of concerns. So, you know, after Kishida, what should we do? This is my question. And now we have, you know, dozen of candidates. Can you, do you know everybody's name? You don't need. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, now, oh, sorry, this is recording. Uh, recorded, right? <laughs> recording is there. Uh, but so, um, I want to call everybody's name now. <laughs> but, you know, I think, you know, uh, the first candidate, uh, the first guy uh, who raised hands is Kobayashi Takayuki, uh, this guy. Uh, actually, he uh, graduated from my university, University of Tokyo Law School, and he also graduated from Harvard. Actually, you know, among these 11 people, five people uh, graduated from Harvard. So somehow Japan started to be very intellectual, in quotation, intellectual. <laughs> but, <coughs> but that means, you know, so many bureaucrats, former bureaucrats, right? But this guy, Kobayashi-san, and Takaichi-san, they are hawkish or right-leaning, you know, prime ministers. And, uh, and Ishiba-san here, uh, Mr. Shigeru Ishiba, uh, he is very popular uh, among voters but he is never popular among MPs of LDP because he is really critical against the mainstream view and policies by former prime ministers. And here, here is uh, uh, Shinjiro Koizumi. He is most likely candidate, most likely uh, winning, I mean, will win uh, the next prime minister's race. And Shinjiro uh, Koizumi is the son of former uh, Prime Minister Koizumi. And, uh, uh, but uh, we still don't know what he really wants to do. But he is super popular among uh, voters. And also he uh, is backed up uh, politically by the former Prime Minister Suga Yoshihide. Uh, and you know, Mr. Koizumi can represent uh, non-mainstream MP views uh, in the uh, next presidential race of LDP. So what I can say now is, you know, of course, uh, because this is, there is a recording, <laughs> it is very difficult to predict now, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but, you know, I have some friends among the candidates, but I think analytically, as a professor, I, I can say uh, Koizumi Shinjiro has the really big chance to win. But what kind of cabinet uh, will he make? I think it will be really decentralized governance style. And, you know, and, you know he will be supported by seasoned uh, veteran politicians. Most importantly, uh, if you know this guy, this guy is also uh, raising his hand uh, in presidential race. Uh, but, you know, this guy's name is Saito Ken, uh, now Minister for Economy, Trade, and Industry. But this guy is really sensible and good balance, and uh, he is the most important friend of Koizumi Shinjiro. So, um, Koizumi Shinjiro, uh, if he is elected, he will, be, he will appoint seasoned uh, politicians uh, for the you know, very important position, including Saito Ken and other you know, uh, experienced uh, ministers, all former ministers. So Koizumi Shinzo administration might be uh, stable in that sense, and we are sure if he is elected, he will make a snap election very soon because he is popular. So, uh, and, you know, he will win the majority seats in a lower house, and that administration may survive for some time being. Ishiba Shigeru, if he is elected, he might be most unusual prime minister uh, last 10 years or so, 
because you know, he recently published a book, but he always makes his stance very clear. He really wants to make the uh, rebalance of Japan's foreign policy. We, he said, we are leaning too much to the United States. So he may have some interest uh, in you know, uh, reshuffling or uh, rebalancing uh, among US, China, and Japan. But I think, you know, except Shigeru, Yoshi, Shigeru Ishiba, uh, other people, including, you know, uh, some uh, conservative candidates like Kobayashi and Takaichi, even they uh, support our mainstream foreign policy, Koizumi too. That is, you know, uh, based on U.S. alliance system. And, you know, they also put big emphasis on U.S. allies' uh, Bilateral relationship, I mean, bilateral relationship with U.S. allies, including Australia, Korea, uh, Philippines, and others. But uh, so Ishiba uh, could be a game changer. So uh, the, almost it is time up, uh, 29 minutes now. So uh, so what I can say is, you know, uh, with some exception, but in most scenario. I think, you know, Kishida legacy will be, will continue even after he leaves the government, right? Most prime ministers, candidates, will take the same uh, foreign policy goals and strategies. But my concern is nationalism, actually, nationalism again. Uh, and, you know, I'm not sure the next prime minister uh, will keep uh, his his, how can I say, uh, nationalistic sentiment inside. Uh, if the next prime minister uh, will go, for example, to Yaskun Shrine, it might make a big, uh, say, uh, new factors uh, to Japan-South Korea relations, for example. Even though the next year is 60th anniversary of Japan-South Korea Basic Treaty, and which we, we believe, you know, next year should be the very momentum uh, or important uh, years for Japan-South Korean partnership. So we, I'm not so sure about the nationalism aspect, but the foreign policy-wise, I mean, foreign policy rationale uh, might be succeeded by uh, next prime minister. Uh, this is what I wanted to say now, and uh, thank you very much for listening, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Sahashi, for um, really your nuanced assessment of Kishida's legacy and also what we can expect from his successor. That was very, um, very enriching, thanks. So I think in the interest of time, we might move straight on to our panel, okay, rather than open for questions now. Um, delighted to invite to join um, myself and Ryo Sahashi um, Professor Alexander Buk from Waseda <coughs> University and also Professor Rumi Aoyama, also from Waseda University. Um, is, is, oh, here we are. Okay, good. So what we're going to be looking at in this panel um, is more broadly and in, in more depth and I'm building on this excellent keynote we've had, um, Japan's foreign relations. Um, particularly in, in Northeast Asia, focusing on that region and, and slightly beyond to Southeast Asia as well. Um, so I'm joined here, as I said, by Professor Buick. He's from the, the Graduate School of Asia-Pacific Studies at Waseda University, as is Professor Aoyama. So we're, Waseda is very well represented um, today. We have to debunk. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so Professor Aoyama is also director of the um, Institute for Contemporary China Studies at Waseda, and she's um, a really eminent China expert. And Professor Butte here um, has um, a very wide research agenda on Northeast Asia, which focuses on both state and non-state actors and he'll be talking about Japan-Russia relations and also Japan-Korea relations. Um, so I will then, um, once I've, I'm, I'm gonna conduct this as a, as a kind of dialogue, I'm gonna ask some questions to our panelists and then we'll open up to questions. So please get your questions ready. I'm sure you have many already. Um, I'm gonna start off with some questions for Professor Sahashi. 
Um, so you did mention that, that Kishida has been instrumental in, in reinvigorating this US, Japan, Korea um, trilateral security network, which many of you know has Cold War inceptions. Um, I was wondering to what extent you think this has, what, what effect this has had on Japan-China relations, um, China's strategic calculus in the region, and to what extent is it, is it sort of providing impetus for this, um, you know, what looks to be, again, a, a reinvigoration of the, the counterpost trilateral network between China, Pyongyang, and, and Moscow? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, and uh, sorry for speaking too much for me. From me, but uh, as a first question uh, is about you know uh, is a really good question, and you know, but uh, for China, uh, I think more. I think they really know you know not only uh, the Japan South Korea U.S. trilateral relationship, but also other trilaterals and quadrilateral uh, networks based on U.S. alliance are so much strengthened recently. And it is almost uh, fixed or, uh, and they cannot change. So um, I think, you know, uh, this is, you know, uh, kind of, say, uh, fix their perception uh, of that, you know, uh, the security architecture in this region has uh, been in the process toward, you know, two blocks. So, uh, this is pity because you know um, this is can become a uh, source of uneasiness on China side and uh, can strengthen their perception uh, to change the, uh, the regional order and architecture in this region uh, and to promote their more divisionistic activities. So, um, so it is a source of security dilemma to some extent. But I really think you know uh, the U.S. based. Uh, minilateralism in security uh, policy areas uh, will not be uh, down, downgraded or will not be uh, suspended uh, uh, in the near time future. Uh, I, I propose, you know, uh, Japan South Korea uh, might make uh, some, uh, might, might suffer uh, from nationalism to some extent in coming years, but still, you know, overall, I think uh, a trilateralism or minilateralism a security format uh, might be might continue, and uh, it could it could serve a source of concerns on China side, but they cannot change uh, this situation. Thank you um, very much, and and just still on on this issue of regional security architecture, um, obviously Prime Minister Abe played a like a really significant role um, in designing the current regional security architecture we have um, today, obviously in first kind of delineating um, the Indo-Pacific as a, as a regional security paradigm, you know, designing some of its attendant norms like the free and open Indo-Pacific and also its attendant institutions like the Quad. Um, do you think that um, Abe represented a kind of aberration in this regard of, of, of like a really strong example of Japan taking regional um, leadership in the security realm? Or can we expect, you know, any of his successors to really carry on leadership in the region um, to that level? And just one sort of, um, sort of connected question. I mean, you, you've mentioned a couple of times, including your paper and your response now, that this is sort of a US-led strategy, a shift to minilateralism. But to what extent can we also understand it as really led by US allies like Japan, Australia through AUKUS, Japan through developing the Quad and things like that to really try to cement the US role, you know, more, more strongly in the region and to encourage the, the, the US to be back in the region. Mm. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I think Abe was strong proponent, supporter uh, for uh, the transformation of Japan security policy. And actually, for me, as an analyst, uh, he made a big contribution to big change after his resignation uh, from prime minister, because he made a big political pressure uh, on Kishida, uh, even on Suga, uh, for defense policy transformation. 
And like the good example is you know two percent target of uh, national defense budget. Um, Kishida, it is said, Kishida uh, received a big pressure uh, from Abe, even the July 2022, you know, uh, when Abe was assassinated. Just before his death, just before his death, uh, Abe made a big pressure on Kishida to, to have a target uh, of defense budget. So, you know, I want to admit Abe's big role in transforming Japan's you know, security policy, and he had big design of Indo-Pacific. But at the same time, I believe, you know, uh, even after his death, or you know, uh, Kishida, uh, even after Abe's death, Kishida uh, you know, continued and expand the security, you know, the transformation of security platform. And, uh, you know, and now, you know, Inside, not only in the politics, but in the bureaucratic system, uh, there is a consensus view that we have to change uh, our post-war security and foreign policy uh, so dramatically. So I think, you know, uh, Abe was powerful, but not so much irregular, as you said. He represents a kind of powerful model, powerful, you know, uh, he proposed powerful idea and influence, but I think you know uh, everybody look at the same direction. Yeah. Thank you um, very much, and I think that that kind of shift that you've mentioned has, has sort of you know given rise to this idea that where Japan is now operating in the the kind of Abe doctrine rather than the the previous Yoshida doctrine. There has been um, quite a lasting shift. I'm now going to move to um, Professor Butte. Okay. Obviously, there's been a huge shift in Japan's relations with Russia from Abe, who focused very much on a diplomatic campaign to resolve the territorial dispute, um, across to the Kishida campaign, where we see Russia now um, at war with Ukraine. It's a very different Russia we're, we're looking at. I'd like um, to ask your thoughts on what, what is the state of Japan's um, relations with Russia today? Uh, thank you very much. Um yeah, sure. Uh, you. you got Sorry, some yes. slides. Uh, I'm not trying to uh, steal the keynote, uh, but I just, uh, I've got some slides, and uh, I'm a nervous speaker, so I've got some notes, and all holding this all together, uh, <laughs> kind of like, I prefer to stand, guys, uh, if it's okay with you. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's, oh, yeah, it's me. It's good. Uh, so, first of all, uh, thank you very much, Lauren, and thank you, Ipe and uh, Shiro, for inviting me to this, uh, uh, to this uh, conference. Uh, very interesting uh, panel. Uh, the, the previous one learned a lot, and so looking forward to... Oh, sorry. Yeah. So I need to repeat the thanks? No, it's okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, anyway, uh, it's great to be back in Canberra, uh, and, uh, and it's definitely respite from the heat in Tokyo. So, um, uh, Japan-Russia relations, um, I think if I, if I jump to the conclusion, uh, basically we're back in, uh, uh, in, 19, in early 1980s. I think that's kind of, that's my way of looking at it. And I'll explain, uh, I'll explain uh, in a second exactly what do I mean by this. So, oh. So uh, just a quick, uh, a brief uh, background. Um, during the Cold War, you know, I mean, the dis dispute over these four islands, yeah, this is, these are the Northern Territories, dominated the, um, uh, the bilateral agenda, especially towards the end of the, uh, of the Cold War. And then from, uh, from 1991 until uh, 2002, so over a decade, yeah, so the collapse of the Soviet Union and, um, uh, you know, New Russia, there were multiple rounds of negotiations, basically, how to solve this dispute. Uh, and were all kind of formulas proposed and uh, in this way and that way, but basically Japan's position has been four islands. We won the four islands back, uh, went nowhere. Uh, then the scandal in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, some problems with uh, the so-called Suzuki Muno incident. So basically from 2003, uh, 2002 till 2013, it's been called like the ice age of uh, Japan-Russia relations. Nothing's been happening. And uh, nothing has been happening in the sense that uh, the negotiations were basically on the territorial dispute were more or less frozen. Uh, the, oh, sorry, I uh, also speak with my hands. Um, uh, but also, um, 
uh, I mean, the business, the, the economic relations been developing, uh, developing, you know, very much unrelated to uh, the territorial dispute. Uh, and then comes Abe Shinzo, uh, and as uh, Sahasan has mentioned, basically one of his, uh, or probably the most important goal of his foreign policy has been getting out of this uh, post-war regime. So resolving all the issues, various issues uh, that remained in Japan from, from post-war, and this uh, this has been seen, the resolving this territorial dispute has been seen by Prime Minister Abe as one of the most important uh, issues uh, re remaining from, uh, from, from the Cold War, or from the post-war, um, uh, Japan's post-war uh, situation. So, um, Prime Minister Abe was, uh, he met Putin, I think, more than any other foreign leader, as you know, 27 times they met. Uh, there was those, those of you that follow uh, Japan's you know, politics, Japan's uh, uh, international relations probably remember the uh, bromance in, Noga in um, Nagato uh, when uh, Prime Minister, uh, when Putin visited Japan, you know, the visit to the onsen uh, and all that. Uh, but uh, basically, I mean, this uh, didn't uh, lead to much. So, the, the, the plan was, uh, Prime Minister Abe's plan, which basically he relied on, on this is recording, right? Uh, so he relied, again, I mean, this is very much open source. He relied, he bypassed, uh, bypassed uh, uh, MFET, so, uh, sorry, uh, MOFA, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He was relying on advisors, mostly from METI. The idea was, we'll bring uh, economic cooperation uh, to Russia. So basically, Russia, Japan's participation in the development of the Far East, uh, joint economic activities on the disputed islands, and, and this was big, uh, basically a softer stance on the four islands return. So at the end, in 2018, Prime Minister Zabez, uh, this uh, famous, uh, the last, I think, I think it was the last meeting with him in, and, and Putin in uh, Singapore, it's, it's not official, but I think, uh, I mean, the, the, the proposal was never made public, but everybody knows basically Japan's position came to, we want the two small islands, yeah, so the Habuma and Shikotan, and some, some kind of symbolic, uh, symbolic rights on the two big islands. Uh, and uh, this was a huge concession, because basically uh, Prime Minister Abe kind of he destroyed the myth of four islands, you know, this, this has dominated Japan's debate on the Soviet Union and Russia over two decades, yeah, well, more even, uh, probably from 1960s onwards, four islands at once, four islands at once, he bursted this myth, this kind of bubble, you know, like, like this idea, uh, we, I mean, this is inherent Japanese territory, we need all the four islands back. Um, so he, uh, but, but the reply from Russia, I mean, it was a failure, yeah, it was a huge failure. Uh, because the reply from Russia basically was, no, we're not giving up any territory, sorry. And 2019 was Foreign Minister Lavrov put in himself, so basically, so basically what happened was a big failure. Uh, the joint activities on the, economic activities on the two small islands didn't really happen as well, all kind of hurdles, all kind of problems. So basically, it was back, uh, I mean, uh, the negotiations on the, uh, on the, four, uh, or the territorial dispute kind of, uh, came to an end. So when uh, Russia invaded Ukraine, uh, February 2022, it was not a big, uh, it wasn't much a dilemma for the Japanese basically what to do. It, it's kind of interesting, I was just thinking now, like what have happened if the negotiations continued and actually there was some progress on the territorial dispute and then Russia invades Ukraine? Uh, it's, it's an interesting, I mean, it's kind of interesting, you know, uh, mental exercise. It didn't happen. So it wasn't, it wasn't a big uh, issue for the Japanese, basically, to side with the West, uh, G7, uh, participating in the sanctions. And, um, and I think, I mean, you can, you can uh, find the list of, uh, the list of sanctions uh, on uh, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, website, very similar to the ones imposed by other uh, by other uh, Western countries, uh, you know, freezing of assets, certain uh, sanctions against certain individuals, against certain companies, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it's important also to remember that Japan-Russia business has not stopped completely. So I was just looking up, uh, like so, from all the businesses that were involved in Russia uh, before 22, I mean, February 22, 35% uh, of Japanese businesses say that business as usual, so they're still there. Um, 
uh, in only 25% of the businesses, they stopped uh, all the activities, yeah? Uh, a lot of uh, pharmaceutical companies, apparently, Japanese pharmaceutical companies, they occupy quite uh, a good position in the Japanese market, so they stayed. Um, uh, the, um, uh, in terms of energy, Japan's dependence on Russia, I mean, Japan imports uh, LNG, coal, and oil from Russia. A little bit of coal, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of, uh, of oil, uh, but uh, Japan's dependence on Russia in LNG is 10%, which I think is, uh, is, is, quite, uh, is quite significant. And basically, uh, Japan's, I mean, so Japan got out of some of the, uh, some of the, uh, the activities, uh, but uh, the Sakhalin 1 and Sakhalin 2, those joint pro uh, projects, they continue to operate. So oil and, uh, and gas continue to flow to Japan. Uh, Russia uh, imposed counter sanctions, of course, on Japan. Japan is in the list of, uh, in the list of, uh, what have this? Oh yeah, I know why I have this. Uh, <laughs> uh, Japan, uh, Russia imposed counter sanctions, so Japan has been put on the list of unfriendly, uh, unfriendly nations. And you can see this Kagarajima. Uh, so that's been an activity. I mean, sorry, it's for the Japanese. Couldn't find it in uh, in English. But basically, this is a tiny, tiny island. Uh, which you can see there. Uh, it's been quite important for convoy officers so for sea kelp uh, gathering activities uh, based on, a, on an agreement. Uh, so these activities, been, Russia has been coming up with all kinds of excuses. The light uh, tower is not working. I mean, but basically, uh, there's been problems there. Uh, and uh, Russia uh, basically refused to negotiate. It's supposed to be annual negotiation of... Um, a fishing around the four, uh, the, the two big islands. Yes, yeah, so the Japanese. So, so it, it is a bit of an issue for the Japanese. It's not a huge, not a hu hugely important fishing grounds, but it is. Um, it is. Um, uh, it is quite important for Hokkaido, for uh, what is it, Eastern Hokkaido uh, fishermen. Um, so kind of going back to like, why am I saying let's, that the relations are back to 1980? Uh, because in 1980, Japan-Russia, uh, Japan-Soviet Union relations, basically, if those who follow Seike Fukabun, so basically the Japanese official position was that uh, no economic cooperation, no trade relations without progress on the territorial dispute uh, being imposed, uh, uh, and also, you know, other areas like, you know, Russia's invasion of Afghanistan, etc. But in reality, there's been there's been uh, some uh, economic activity going. Uh, and the factors that affected those economic activities were not really related to the progress on the territorial dispute. Um, and this is, uh, this is, you can see, like the, um, the economic activities, the trade between Russia and Japan. You can see a huge drop in 2023. So half, uh, uh, so 50% uh, drop in bilateral trade. Uh, this is after the sanctions, uh, so after the war. But um, but basically, so this is the first time, I guess, uh, in you know, post-war Japan-Russia relations that politics been affecting, uh, po politics do affect uh, Japan-Russia relations, but some business continues, you know, so like in necessary areas, especially for the Japanese, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the economic relations continue. So this is what I mean back to 1980s. Basically, there are sanctions imposed by the Japanese relations. Political relations are not good, very not good. Uh, we can put it this way. Uh, but some business, some economic activities uh, continue. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you um, for that excellent update on the bilateral relationship. Um, and while you're standing there, I'll, I'll ask you about one, one more <laughs> neighbor of Japan's. Um, let's turn to Japan-South Korea relations, always um, exciting. Um, Pro Professor Sa Sahashi mentioned in, in his keynote today that um, Japan didn't need to expand really any diplomatic political resources in sort of bringing about the rapprochement with, with South Korea. Um, it was really South Korea that had to carry that burden. Um, but someone would also, I guess some would also interpret that as Japan didn't want to um, do that, you know. Mm. Um, in many ways, you could say that it's not really looking like a very equal partnership. Um, and if the, the next Korean president is more diplomatically assertive with Japan, as was the Moon administration, um, it's, mm. it's hard to really imagine how they're, they're really going to stay on this track of South Korea having to repair any damage to the relationship. What are your thoughts on Japan-Korea relations? Have they finally sort of made inroads in 
overcoming the historical problems or is this just a, a sort of temporary hold um, that we're seeing at the moment? Uh, thank you, uh, Lauren. I'll be short on Japan-Korea. Sorry, I uh, took too much time for the Japan-Russia, I guess. And especially because uh, Sashi's uh, talked about a bit about us. I think, like, to, again, to get to the conclusion, I think it's moving in a positive direction. Uh, but, uh, again, uh, so kind of cautious uh, optimism. Uh, so we're talking about, very briefly, just, uh, you know, three issues, and all related to the colonial rule. This is the Takeshima territorial dispute, the comfort women issue, uh, and, uh, and the forced labor issue. Yeah, so the forced labor, sorry, I've got the territorial dispute. I mean, obviously, I didn't put any photos of, uh, uh, of uh, people involved in the other two disputes. Uh, so, uh, so what's been happening, I think, uh, again, I'll, I'll just to make, to make it short and we can get back to this uh, in, you know, in the Q&A. I think the forced labor has been the biggest issue. I mean, the two, two, two issues. So the comfort women, uh, basically the agreement's been reached by uh, Park and, and, and Prime Minister Abe. Uh, President Moon basically kind of forced by the public. Uh, he, he basically canceled it. And this was a big shock to the Japanese, like, but we signed an agreement, you know? You can't, like, because a new president, uh, you can't say that it's, it's all null and void, you know? It was um, uh, an agreement. I don't know actually what's the, uh, like, it, it, it's, it's an agreement. I mean, I don't know what it's like international legal status, but at least from the Japanese side, it was seen like this is like an official agreement between two countries. Uh, and then the, uh, this, the, the forced labor, so basically these are people who were, uh, you know, forced to work for some Japanese companies during the war. Uh, so uh, the uh, high court, the, the Korean Supreme Court basically uh, issued um, uh, 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 verdicts demanding compensations to be paid to them by Japanese companies and froze some of the assets in, uh, in Korea. And this was another huge shock, I think, to the Japanese because basically the Japanese approach is the 1965 agreement, uh, normalization uh, agreement between the two countries resolved those, uh, you know, uh, all individual compensations. So it's up to the Jap Korean government to compensate these people if, uh, you know, if they find it, um, uh, you know, uh, legitimate under the Korean law. So, um, so that's, uh, that, that's, been, uh, that, that's been the two, two big issues. Uh, was, uh, the uh, um, Japanese, I mean, after this, Japanese imposed de facto restrictions on export to Korea, and there was the, uh, uh, the boycott Japanese good movements in, in, in Korea. This is a photo I took uh, out of all the slides. This is the only photo that I actually I took. You know, this is actually mine. And this is, if you can see, this is Japanese izakaya in, 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 in Seoul, which is participating in the boycott movement uh, of Japanese goods, which I find quite, uh, quite interesting. But um, you're absolutely right. I mean, uh, uh, President uh, Yoon has been much more accommodating uh, towards Japan. It took a few, uh, quite a few steps to improve relations with Japan. Um, basically established a foundation to compensate, to compensate the forced labor. Uh, they basically went back to the uh, Comfort Women Agreement. But why, I mean, I think, uh, I think uh, that uh, President Yoon is definitely moving in the direction of closer relations with Japan. But I think uh, the question is, who's going to be next? And I think this is the question that uh, a lot of people in Japan are asking themselves as well, like, who's going to be the next president? And what we see in Korea today, and this is, I think, uh, part of a more global phenomenon, but basically what we see is um, this polarization of the society between, I don't even know if to call it left or right these days, uh, in, the, in, in the Korean context, left and right have very specific meaning. But this, uh, I mean, this polarization between the left and right in Korea is very much evolved around relations with Japan and especially the interpretation of the colonial past. So what we see in Korea, it's called new right. Uh, so they are, I mean, they're the, like uh, the new right movement, uh, which uh, they do have some economic policies which resemble, I guess, new right kind of uh, libertarianism. Uh, in the West, but they're one of the main kind of their uh, uh, arguments or is, uh, is the interpretation of colonial history. So basically, and this is a huge kind of movement for Koreans, basically they're saying we achieved modernization thanks to Japanese being colonized by Japan, so colonial modernization. 
Uh, and some of these people are close to President Yoon. I mean, uh, one of them has been appointed the head of, um, uh, what is it, uh, the uh, Academy of Korean Studies. Yeah, so that's uh, quite a big news in Japan. Uh, and the left, uh, the, the, the left, the nationalist left, which is very much kind of, you know, um, I wouldn't say anti-Japanese, but they have a very, very strong, uh, very suspicious view of Japan today and a very strong view of the colonial history. Uh, they moving even further to the, to the, again, I mean, I don't know what's the best term. I mean, I'm tempted to say left, but basically, so like, uh, you know, the new interpretation, so uh, uh, Sigmund Rhee, like Yi Sing Man, the first president of, uh, of Korea, they argued that he is, the, the guy, I mean, if you look it up, he hated Japan. He's got a book on Japan. But they say he, he was a pro-Japanese pro -Japanese collaborator, yeah? So you've got this history wars which actually dividing the society. And if the next president is from the so-called progressive or the, you know, the leftist camp, uh, it's possible that uh, he, uh, he or she uh, would be uh, forced to, uh, you know, driven by, again, those demands. I mean, if you look at public, at public opinion polls, the, the society is almost uh, divided in half, like which side you look at. Uh, so, you know, there's the new right and, and, and the left. So, uh, could be, um, could be uh, problematic for japan career relations. We could see return back to those history-related uh, issues again. Yeah, that's my take on it. Thank you very much, Alex. Um, it, it seems almost as though the, the main variable that's going to determine the, the fate of this relationship moving forward is really South Korean's uh, leader, South Korean leader's willingness to enforce, you know, lawsuits waged by colonial victims vis-a-vis -vis the Japanese government. And it also seems that, you know, the Japanese government has become so sensitised to any attempts by South Korea to challenge the 1965 treaty agreement that even if, if a South Korean leader um, is, even brings up, you know, this issue that we've, we've had another lawsuit, we've had an, another win by one of the, the colonial victims, we have to discuss this. That alone seems to be enough to kind of really destabilise things um, with Japan, so it will be interesting if, if the Progressive Party is leading Korea next, things could, could change um, significantly. So thank you, Alex, for that, that great um, assessment, and I'm sure the audience will have more questions for you. Um, next, and finally, I'd like to turn to Professor Aoyama, and I'd like to ask her, as Director of the Institute of China Studies, to really give her, um, give us her assessment of where um, we're tracking with China-Japan relations um, these days. W would you like to use slides as well? Or you... uh, no, I didn't prepare a long speech, so I think I will just sit here and answer your question, okay? <laughs> Okay, so Japan-China relations is very important for Japan and for the region and for the world as well, but it's really complicated. So, uh, but I would say that, uh, well, as I understand it, I think the relationship between China and Japan has been relatively, relatively stable, but it's becoming more and more strained. So it, first of all, about the stability, I think two factors may have contributed to the stability. So the first thing is the economic relationship. So it has continues to be a resilient one. So in 2023, last year, China was Japan's uh, largest trading partner in Japan was China's second largest trading partner. So the economic relations is still very uh, close. And also there's a political factor that may, may contribute to the stability of the bilateral relations. So first of all, the Japanese government has uh, adopted some kind of uh, economic security policies, but I think it is designed to sort of build a small yard high fence. So the target uh, so the target is kind of limited, and the Japanese government is still going to maintain a resilient economic relations. Um, from the view of China, I think, well, it, when we talk about Japan-China relations, it's kind of interesting. People usually compare Japan-China relations with Australia-China relations. 
So, yeah, in the, well, several years ago, uh, people will ask the question that uh, when, so when the time when Australia-China uh, relations were relatively strained, some people looked at Japan and asked why Japan was able to strike a delicate balance between deterrence and functional. Uh, cooperation. And nowadays, some of the Japanese are asking the opposite question. What can we learn from Australia? So I think to compare the relationship between Japan and China uh, with that between Australia and China is a legitimate one if we look at China's foreign policy. Because uh, in the past, when we look at the China's uh, historical diplomacy, we can see at a time when relations between China and the U.S. are strained, China tends to take a more conciliatory stance towards the country in between. So that includes China, uh, Japan, and Australia. So therefore, nowadays, winning the support of Japan and Australia Will, would be currently the basic principle of China's foreign policy. So this may be a further factor that contributes to the stability of the two countries. But on the other hand, uh, the, uh, the bilateral relations between Japan and China would be more and more strained in the near future. So it is because uh, it is not because of Japan's policy toward China has changed, but it is because China's tactics toward Japan has changed. So we all know Japan's China's foreign policy has not changed a lot. And actually, what Japan's foreign uh, China policy is no weaker than Australia's uh, policy toward China on issues such as the South China Sea, human rights policies on Taiwan. And also, Japan actually changed uh, Japan, since 2010, I would say. Japan has consistently challenged China's core uh, national interests by holding a joint military exercise in the South China Sea or taking the lead in issuing international statements condemning China's behavior in South China Sea or China's policy on Hong Kong. So, but the thing is that China's policy toward China has changed. In the past, I mean, uh, China's policy toward Japan under uh, Abe administration or the earlier part of Kishida administration, where China has, uh, the Chinese government has focused on mending the relations with the incumbent government of Japan. But since almost uh, the last year, China has shifted its policy focus to people-to-people -to -people exchange as a means of pressure on the government in power. So which means the Chinese government is going to put more pressure on the Japanese governments uh, across various uh, areas and also, uh, well, they may pick some different like issues to put pressure on Japan. So, uh, but I, I, I have to say that China's policy toward Japan has backfired. And we can see a growing number of voices are opening, denouncing the Japanese government's soft stance toward China right now in Japan. So, in short, I would say, given China's approach to Japan, uh, the bilateral relations will not dramatically deteriorate in the short term, but they will become more strained in the near future. Thank you very much. And I'll just ask one more question before we turn over um, to the audience. It's sort of a two-part question. Um, a few years ago, I, I heard a Japanese defense official um, say, um, Japan has three major security concerns. The first is China, second is China, third is China. <laughs> um, 
alluding to the complexity of the China issue for Japan, I was wondering, you know, what you think um, the Japanese government really defines as the key challenges um, in dealing with China today. And the second part of that question is you mentioned the people-to-people -people exchange um, between Japan and China. Um, I was wondering, what, what is the state of the track two relations between China and Japan? I know that with Korea and Japan, whenever, you know, the relationship has become really strained at the official level, there's a very strong track two relationship between experts in both countries. I was wondering what the, the, the case is with Japan-China um, relations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so <laughs> very good and important one difficult it will, it will be kind of difficult to answer so i would say that for japan the main and for most, uh, uh, the most important challenge face uh, japan is china but because of the geopolitics but i would not say it's china 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 no, <laughs> no not anymore <laughs> Because, well, due to geographical proximity, Japan faces serious security challenges from China, Russia, and North Korea. Well, at the same time. So that's the new situation we are facing right now. Uh, so, for example, so the, the East China Sea, the security policies of China and Russia are increasingly converging. And North Korea is adopting a more and more proactive stance and is accelerating the development of its missile and nuclear programs. And also the military balance across Taiwan Strait is tipping in China's favor. So Japan is facing a severe security environment right now. And that is why Japan is working very closely with Australia uh, and uh, the United States and other like-minded uh, countries. And I think that part as a deterrence strategy is very effective. And, uh, but on the other hand, I do think Japan needs to have a, a de-escalation strategy in the meantime. So deterrence can prevent a war from uh, uh, to happen, but on the other hand, we need to have a very sophisticated de-escalation policy right now. So uh, the second part is about the, the current, uh, the track two. So I think in the past, there are two pillars that have stabilized the bilateral relations. The first is the economic ties, and the second is people-to-people -people ties. So economic ties is still very resilient. But on the other hand, uh, the, the, I think it, the, the, I have a data, I think, the the direct like investment in Jap uh, in China from Japan has dropped ten percent compared to the year uh, to the previous year in twenty twenty three. So which means so it's still uh, resilient, but the economic ties may be weakening in the near future into people-to-people uh, -to -people ties. And uh, after COVID, I think the people-to-people the -people ties are weakening. Uh, the, the, these, these factors is also weakening as well. We don't have a lot of uh, track to dialogues with China anymore, which is a, pr which is a problem. And uh, that is not, well, I think, Chinese scholars, officials, and also students are still coming to Japan. But there are security concerns on our side to go to China because, you know, uh, because well, in, the, uh, in last decade, a lot of Japanese have been detained 
uh, in China. So that's a severe security concern on our side. And many people are, uh, uh, they, they are afraid of going to China because of their personal security issues. So the track to exchanges between the two countries is also weakening. So I would say, so that is why uh, the, the, although it's relatively stable right now, but it can be very fragile. Thank you very much. Um, you've just heard from three wonderful experts. Um, our panelists um, on Japan's relations in Northeast Asia. And now I'm very happy to open up to our audience, both in person and online. I already have one question from online. Um, any, any questions at all? Okay, we'll start. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Bruce Miller, I probably should out myself as a former ambassador to Japan from 2011 to 2017, uh, during which time I had a fair bit of visibility of what was going on inside the Japanese government on the matters that we've been talking about. And then since then as well, that, that has continued. In particular, I, and I, there's a reason I'm saying all of this, which I'll come to in a moment, but I, I knew Abe Shinzo for 20 years. I knew, I've known Kishida-san for 15 years. So. I have some understanding of how they thought and think. Um, so I want to pick up on Sahish Sensei's comments that Kishida is dovish by disposition and that Abe had a continued <coughs> high level of influence over Kishida even after he stepped down. Uh, I very much I, I agree with those statements, uh, uh, but I just wanted to add a slight gloss to them, I suppose, and to say that we shouldn't underestimate the extent to which Kishida, as foreign minister under Abe, uh, went through a, a pretty bruising experience in his own dealings with Chinese, Korean, and other counterparts through that period, which I think changed his uh, view of many things. He became quite vocal inside government uh, uh, on relations with China, on relations with Korea, in a way that you wouldn't expect of someone uh, with an originally dovish disposition. Although that's what he remains at heart, I must say. I'd also say that um, really that uh, I suppose China's activities and uh, Russia's activities more recently have, have been the things that have driven these changes in Japanese uh, security policy. Uh, without those changes in the external environment, I think it would have been very difficult both for Abe, Shinzo, and for Kishida to have actually reached consensus across the ruling party and with the Kometo, uh, uh, minor coalition party, uh, to uh, support all these changes. The, the changes in the external environment are what gave the oxygen to uh, all those changes. And in the end, uh, even after Abe's death, it was Kishida who achieved uh, significant changes in 2022, uh, which uh, a very senior Japanese official said to me, and I, I agree, uh, were things that even Abe could not do, that Kishida was able to achieve in his own right. So just a bit of um, commentary from a, um, a retired ambassador, and you know, what, you know what retired ambassadors are like, they can go on too long, but uh, I'd be interested to see what uh, Sahai Sensei or others might have to say about that, but thank you. It's on. Okay, thank you, Ambassador, for excellent comments. And actually, I really agree with what you said. First of all, you know, Kishida has changed a lot uh, during his tenure as Holy Minister under Shinzo Abe. It is really right uh, interpretation. And actually, you know, within his uh, group, uh, Kochikai, uh, you know, there are two blocks, you know, uh, you know very left leaning people. Like including Koga and, and you know uh, light, not light, but uh, you know middle center uh, pe centrist people, and you know after having a few years experience under Abe as a foreign minister, uh, Kishida decided to change the discourse and the kind of center uh, kind of the group idea. You know they had a really long debate within Kochikai, and Kishida decided he has to he had to kick out uh, the left-leaning ideas on people uh, from Kochikai. 
So, it, you know, he was brave enough, I think, you know, uh, you know before running to uh, presidential elections uh, in LDP. So, I think, yeah, so, you know, I totally agree with you, you know, his experience as foreign minister uh, changed his mindset. But at, but at the same time, Coach Kai, the dovish, uh, kept their dovish image, even when Kishida uh, took his tenure as prime minister. So it is very funny, you know, but the people are always very slow in changing their perception, right? And Kishida is not like Abe. Kishida always doesn't talk well, right? So <laughs> Abe always want debate, right? Want debate and very, you know, uh, how can I say, uh, having a, some very strong image, you know? And, you know, he, pro he wanted to promote the idea, but uh, Abe always tried to have some fight in Congress. But Kishida always, you know, not so clear about his ideology, so he successfully kept his image as dovish. And actually, Aso and, and Abe really wanted to make that image, according to my interview uh, to the closest of people uh, in the politics. And the second thing is about Ukraine. Ukraine. You are all, I totally with you about that, you know, uh, even though, you know, many things happened because of domestic context, but Ukraine war, I mean, Russian invasion to Ukraine, changed the context of security debate in Japan. You know, as academia, uh, it is very interesting because Ukraine, Ukraine, Ukrainian war is not in East Asia or is not in surrounding area of Japan. But it changed the most of the perception among Japanese people and voters. And the government and you know, commentators, pundits, they really wanted to, that, wanted to make that opportunity to change the discourse in Japan and finally you know, uh, made the big change possible or in Japan's politics. So, uh, you know, I'm an you know, inter IR scholar, but I was so shocked just in, and interested why such a global war, not regional war, change the perception of my country? But you are really right. Thank you very much. I'm going to take two questions. Just here, Peter Dostale and John McCarthy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, look, uh, I'm John McCarthy. I'm a <coughs> former Foreign Service type with a tour in, uh, in Japan. Um, just two questions, if I might. Look, they, they say there are no difficult questions, only difficult answers. So the first is this, taking account of circumstances and taking account of changes in or interpretations of the Japanese constitution, how far in the circumstances of hostilities between the United States and Taiwan, how far do members of the panel think Japan will be prepared to go to support the United States? That's the first question. The second question is this. Um, what is the Japanese view now of the degree to which uh, you might call it the allies, the United States, Japan, Australia, are making, are able to influence Southeast Asia? because one gets the strong impression that the United States has not done very well in Southeast Asia in the last decade. Whereas Japan's actually been pretty active and I think their diplomacy has been very successful. Australia somewhere in between. So those two questions, if I may. Uh, my question uh, sort of, I think compliments John's. Uh, and, and it's about the framing of Sahashi's presentation, really, in terms of uh, the, a question about the metric whereby you measure Kishida's success in foreign policy. It seems to me your narrative suggests the metric uh, of success really is the implementation uh, at the behest of Abe and his supporters of the change in the Abe re regime, basically, uh, to the Abe, Abe regime. Uh, but, of course, your subsequent presentation suggested 
that there are other imperatives in Japan's foreign security policy, including the multilateral governance issue and the problem of the United States in dealing with that. Uh, and so there are serious strategic issues whereby you might alternatively judge Kishida's success or otherwise. So I wonder what you think the chances are that these other issues will be welded into a change in the regime from Yoshida to post Abe uh, in, the, in the array of leadership candidates or political influences that, that are emerging in Japan now. Okay, so I'm just going to ask Professor Aoyama to address John McCarthy's question, and then you, um, Sahashi Sam, will um, address the second question, plus an online question. How has AUKUS been understood in Japan? Okay. <laughs> okay, so the uh, revision of constitution in Japan, I would say that uh, it is a very important political agenda for many politicians in Japan, but it is not that urgent anymore because Japan has, uh, uh, the, uh, under the uh, uh, administration, Japan has adopted some new security doc uh, doctrines that will allow Japan to support the US and other like-minded alliance. So that's one reason. And, and also, uh, Sahai-san has mentioned the Ukraine war has totally reshaped public opinion uh, in terms of whether or not we should support the US or other allies as well. Because well, in the past, I would say that the, the politician, the majority of the politicians and also some of the leading scholars, they actually, they, they, they have the same stance. Uh, of supporting the, the, the U.S. and other security, uh, on security issues. But uh, there had been, uh, it's very, it was very difficult for them to gain public support. But the Ukraine war actually changed the atmosphere in Japan overnight. Yep, that is because Ukraine war is, or has been a wake-up call for many Japanese that war can actually happen overnight. So that has raised the security awareness and also that it changed the total uh, uh, public, uh, changed the reshape the public opinion in Japan. And so nowadays, I don't, so back to your question, and I, I don't think the constitution issue is that urgent. But I think, uh, well, it will be still be on the list of political agenda, but it will not hinder our ability to support our allies in on the. What would you do? What would you do? <laughs> do what do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> you mean to, to to revise or to support? support. Hmm. Well, <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it is a difficult question to answer. <laughs> yeah, but uh, well, I think uh, under the current law of Japan, uh, Japan can support the U.S. if the uh, Japan's territory is or will be attacked by the, its enemy. So it's, it really depends on the situation that will happen in the future, and also it will depend on the interpretation by the uh, government during that time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> so, Sahashi, Sahashi Sensei will, will come in now. Yeah, actually, um, it, it, it is very difficult, uh, and you, your question has so many aspects, but I, I can share just two. And the first one is, um, as uh, Professor Aoyama said, uh, about the constitutional change, I think the agenda, uh, you know, the next prime minister uh, want to bring that agenda. Uh, about the change of constitution, but that might be, you know, how can we include the new clause 
uh, in Article 9. You know, some people uh, you know, in LDP, there's an idea to, uh, to add the third code uh, in Article 9, uh, which, ad which will admit the uh, presence of SDF as military. Uh, but you know, uh, but beyond that, I, I really think you know the last change of interpretation. Uh, actually, this is not the interpretation, but change of interpretation uh, over uh, collective self-defense right uh, might enable Japan to make a lot of things. You know, if they admit uh, that situation will affect on the survival of Japanese people. But so the next one is more substantial. So what Japan will do, you know, if Taiwan contingency happens? Actually, it is still very debatable uh, in Japan, even among specialist circle. Uh, but I think, you know, first, first things we have to do, what we are thinking to do is to protect our islands in southwestern area, including Senkaku. So that is the most urgent for us to do uh, in, in the time of Taiwan contingency. And the second thing might be uh, uh, kind of uh, evacuations of non-combatant people from Taiwan Islands. And for that, actually, we, international community and society, has to work together because there are, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, uh, foreigners, living in Taiwan. So we have to work together with that. And, but, but beyond that, maybe SDF uh, will be requested to work closely with, you know, United States Force uh, you know, uh, in operating, especially in maritime area and airtime area. And also, you know, we might be requested to support, you know, uh, or at least have to take uh, some measures uh, to help uh, uh, Taiwan uh, Air Force. I don't know what ca we can do. And the all discussions are still under the table, I mean, under the, you know, kind of government restriction. But I really think they start to speak more candidly but maybe the discussion are still going on. So we don't know. But what we can say is Japan is not ready enough to go uh, operation on grounds of Taiwan. So, you know, boots on the ground is too difficult for Japan to take. And, you know, uh, here, finally, you know, it is very important. In Taiwan, there are many big expectations for Japan and Japan SDF, you know, in the time of contingency among Taiwan people, you know, according to public polls in Taiwan, but maybe we cannot satisfy all expectations on Taiwan side. So this is an uh, issue. So, and Peter's question, it's excellent. So, um, you know, Kishida was really good. Kishida is, say, very diligent, uh, you know, in completing his or Japan's homework, uh, you know, uh, for U.S.-Japan alliance. Right? So recently, uh, maybe you know, Joe Nye and Richard Armitage, Dick Armitage, uh, always published uh, Armitage Nye report. But recent report, I can, I can say, you know, they gave the 100 a score to Japan, right? But that means, you know, Kishida completed the homework. But this is a judgment or evaluation from the old standard, right? So what you know, uh, we, what should Japan do after the real change happen? This is still, you know, um, unfinished business in Japan. So we have to think more closely, you know, if Trump will come back, Trump too might really destroy the foundation of international security order and economic order. What should we do? Nobody thinks very seriously about that in Japan. They still believe, you know, we can manage that. But I think we really need, you know, the new scenario. I don't want to say it's a plan B, but uh, it's a kind of, you know, scenario B or, you know, vision B. We should do that. But, and that time maybe we will have the new, uh, new doctrine, not the Yoshida doctrine type, you know. What Kishida do is still expansion of Yoshida doctrine. But so in that time, we will have. But I really don't think bureaucrat system in Japan really will well prepared for that. So I think, you know, academia and journalists, you know, uh, people have to, they have to think very seriously about that. But. I just want to take one final question um, from John, John Lamb, um, who's just finished his PhD on Australia-Japan relations. Yeah, congrats, John. <laughs> uh, thank you, Lauren. Um, sorry, I'm a, a bit nervous here because I'm not your trained ambassador. And uh, <laughs> oh, 
I want to be much more controversial, actually. I was a bit stunned to hear how Kishida, in a sense, forsook his principles to preserve his position. It sounded to me, it rang of a bit of what we deal with Netanyahu today and what the horrific things that go on there and how that could be easily stopped by the US. So I'm very worried to hear of those things and the sorts of other things we see here of what was presented of the LDP and the domination of, um, well, we heard Harvard, but particularly Todai, um, Todai Law School in the um, diplomatic circles and in, in the politics and through the LDP. It, it makes me kind of think um, maybe we're better without major political parties and all independent candidates. And I must out myself here. I'm a graduate of Waseda University, but before Aoyama Sensei was born. Um, so what, what have we got here? And, and one little point I'd like to, to raise in that. I was very lucky to be a Kokuhi Ryugakse, a Japanese government scholar, uh, funded at Waseda. And, but I've recently heard that Mombusho, um, Mombukogaku Gijusho, no longer funded students going to private universities. I think that's sad, and I'd just like to open this group up to some different thinking. Thank you. I think about the international student, uh, at least University of Tokyo, always very welcome international students. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we are still accepting many mixed fellowship students, uh, including my own uh, in my laboratory. So uh, I think uh, for private university, you know, the rule might be a little bit changed, uh, but uh, we are always very welcome. We have double degree program. And uh, uh, thank you very much I'm for sorry, Crawford School. Sorry, Waseda University hasn't changed its <laughs> policy, and we also welcome you. International student. <laughs> Sorry, we compete each other <laughs> in Japanese market, but but so but I think you know we are still really fine uh, with uh, uh, accepting. And, but uh, what I really want to see more is you know the change of Japan side. I mean Japanese students studying in Australia and and in other countries and. And you know, uh, we really want to see uh, more future diplomats from many circles. Uh, but I'm really happy to see today, you know, one of my seminar students here, uh, she, she, she was in my seminar at the University of Tokyo, and she wants to go, uh, become a diplomat, and she studied now in ANU. So I think uh, we have a really good future. And just, a, just a one a reaction to the question from uh, screen, over the screen about AUKUS and how Japan sees that. So uh, very briefly, but uh, I think you know, Japan really uh, understands the strategic meaning of AUKUS. Right? So in the last summit meeting between Joe Biden and Kishida, uh, you know, they promised that Japan will have a future collaboration with AUKUS at the tier two uh, for the future scientific and technological cooperation. And I think you know, Japan is now very ready for that because we have some technological background, but also we recently introduced a new system of security clearance. So, and also government start to be very, I can say, aspired uh, to invest more uh, scientific and engineering you know, fund uh, to uh, such a collaboration. So I think the time is very ripe for AUKUS cooperation, uh, but our worry is AUKUS will survive in the next US, pres US president. But, but I think you know, we are really uh, positive for uh, Japan AUKUS collaboration. Thank you. This has been um, a really rich, enriching discussion and I'd like to thank our wonderful panellists and also the great questions that came from you, the audience. So please join me in thanking them and then we head to lunch.